This is Ingenious Inventions, and we're going to find out about some new and exciting sequencing techniques to study viruses. And so let me introduce our team of presenters today. First is Elizabeth Lopez. She is a biology teacher at Granada High School. And Mrs. Lopez got her master's from Clemson University, and she teaches biology and biotechnology. Our scientist from the laboratory, Dr. Monica Barocchi. She is a virologist, and she got her degree from Colorado State University, and she's joined by Dr. Jonathan Allen, who's a computer scientist, who received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University. And I know you're all really anxious and excited to hear about our talk. So without further ado, here we go. Good morning, thank you all for showing up. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about reconstructing a rabies epidemic bite by bite, meaning computer bites. Um, but before we get started, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have been doing bacteriology and virology for about 20 years now, um, focusing on evolution. My um, early years in school were in biology, um, but then my, um, my taller but younger sister told me I wasn't tall enough to be a real biologist, and so I went into microbiology. And actually, I, I did it because I liked the infectious disease angle, not because of the height issues or anything. Um, okay. So the presentation today. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about viruses, why they're interesting, and the types of outbreaks that they cause. And then Jonathan will be telling you about the new sequencing technology that allows us to look at viruses in a completely different way. And then finally, we'll discuss a rabies outbreak that occurred in Northern California a few years ago and how we use next generation sequencing to understand the outbreak. Okay, so three quarters of newly discovered viruses, um, I'm sorry, Three quarters of recently discovered human diseases are caused by viruses rather than bacteria. And most of these viruses have an RNA genome rather than a DNA genome. And most are transmitted from an animal source to humans and then changed to be able to go human to human. And so there are one to four new human pathogens discovered each year. Many of these just go away or cause limited cases, but some go on to cause epidemics, such as the case of West Nile virus, SARS virus, do you guys remember that, 2003, and um, Zika and Ebola. And these viruses have all emerged within the lifetime of most of you. So it's just been you know, less than two decades for most of them. There's also um, viruses that are currently circulating in a more limited pattern. They haven't caused really big outbreaks yet such as um, bird flu or avian influenza, as well as the Middle Eastern Respiratory Sy um, Syndrome virus, MERS virus, um, which is interesting in that it seems to be transmitted by camels. And so this, this slide here shows you the different types of reservoir animal hosts that these viruses are coming from, the different diseases they cause, and then the type of symptoms associated with the disease. And you can see some of these are pretty severe viruses. Um, have, have you guys heard of any of them? I know you guys probably know Ebola. Anybody know Nipah virus? Yes. yes. Okay, you probably saw Contagion. That was what it was based on. So there's um, some, some familiar viruses, most recently Zika causing microcephaly. Uh, something that was completely unexpected for this type of virus. Um, so viruses continue to emerge and they continue to cause serious disease. And we're hoping to develop methods to to um, predict which viruses are most likely to jump into humans and cause epidemics. <clears throat> for those of you who don't remember what a virus is, lucky for you, they're very simple. This is a reminder slide. So viruses are extremely simple. Um, they just consist of, bare minimum, a nucleic acid. It can be DNA or RNA, as well as a protein coat to protect the amino acid or the um, nucleic acid. And then finally, some viruses, when they exit the cell, they take part of the cell membrane with them. And so that's called an envelope. And in this case, they'd have to protrude their own proteins from the outside of the envelope so they have a way to bind to and enter the host cell. So very simple organisms. The picture there on the right is a picture of the, the viruses budding from the host cell. 
Okay, and what's so interesting about these organisms or microbes um, is that they're extremely simple, but they can cause very devastating and quite a variety of diseases. Um, they are completely dependent on the host cell to propagate. If you have a virus sitting on a countertop or on the floor, it's not going to be able to grow because there's no living host cell for it to replicate in. So the basic life cycle of a, a virus is it has these outer proteins that allow it to recognize susceptible cells and to enter the cell. The nucleic acid genome, um, or collection of virus genes, is released into the cell, and the virus replicates either in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. And then it uses a host machinery, such as the ribosomes, to make its proteins. It assembles into a new viral particle, and then it either exits the virus by budding through the membrane, or it just replicates to the extent that the cell simply bursts. So it's a very, a very simple life cycle, but very effective. Now, RNA, RNA viruses are near and dear to my heart. They are interesting in that they've got very small genomes. Some of them code for as little as seven, five, seven, ten proteins in their entire genome, yet they cause very serious diseases and they evade the human immune system and spread to different species and to new geographical areas fairly regularly. So this is a very interesting group of viruses. And this virus, or these viruses, are interesting and um, successful in part because they mutate really quickly. The enzyme that they need to replicate their genome makes lots of mistakes. On average, every time the genome is replicated, there is one mistake. So if you start out with a founding virus, such as little purple virus on the left, and it enters a host and replicates in that host, the, the errors build and build until soon you have a swarm of different genotypic variants. So genomes that vary by amino or by um, nucleotide changes that are related to the founding virus but are genetically distinct. Oftentimes, you have a particular genotype that's really successful, and there will be more of that genotype in the population. So we're talking about populations of viruses inside a host that are genetically slightly different, and they're called, called quasi-species or mutant spectra. Okay, one thing I'm going to be talking about, I mentioned the genome, which is the collection of genes. I also talk about genotypes. So inside the host, there's variants, and we refer to those as genotypes because they're slightly different versions of the original genome. Okay, and so we just got done talking about genetic drift. I'm, yes, and now we're going to play telephone, or at least Liz's kids are, and worry about phonetic drift. All right, good morning. Um, as she said, genetic drift is simply the accumulation of small mutations or small mistakes as species continue to replicate. So we're going to do this by playing a very simple game that I'm sure you have all played at a birthday party at some point, the game of telephone. So as viruses are going to accumulate mutations over time, our phrase, as it goes through our group of students, is going to accumulate mistakes over time. We'll start off and we'll see what we end up with. Do you know which phrase you are going to use? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and start telephone going across. Okay, what was the original se sentence or phrase? Rabies outbreaks are scary. <laughs> what did we end up with at this side? Babies take out fairies. <laughs> so while it does sound the similar, similar, and you can see how that mistake would have accumulated over that, it's definitely picked up some errors as we've gone through our 10 or so students. That is a great way to demonstrate genetic drift. Small changes as the virus replicates and as the sentence has been passed from student to student. Thanks, guys.
Okay, great job, little variants. Um, all right, so RNA viruses exist in these populations we're calling quasi-species because their genomes are all slightly different. Now, what role does that play in disease? So as, as scientists have noticed the quasi-species, they've designed experiments to figure out what role quasi-species play in, in disease manifestation. And one particularly interesting experiment was done about 10 years ago at UCSF where they were looking at poliovirus. Now, poliovirus has a very small RNA genome, and they were actually working with a mouse model of poliovirus, where if they inoculated the virus into, for example, the leg of the mouse, the virus would replicate and make it to the brain and then kill the, um, kill the mouse. Now, when they did this, they took the virus that made it to the brain and they grew it up in two different types of populations. They grew it up in such a way that it could not mutate that much for one population. And that's shown here on the top of the slide where the red virus is the one that they got from the brain, the genotype present in the brain. And the pink ones are just slight variants, but not a lot of change because of the conditions that they used. The second population allowed the virus to mutate freely. And so you see a much more diverse community of viruses in this um, group or in this um, preparation. So the first experiment, they put the more clonal, um, genetically similar group of viruses into the mouse the same way they did before, but that mouse was just fine because it could not make the, the, um, the virus that had previously grown in the brain and killed it could not make it to the brain. However, if they put the diverse population in with that really virulent or, or um, pathogenic virus, then that enabled the virus to make it to the brain and to kill the mouse. So this is telling us that the, the quasi-species diversity is essential, in some cases, to the outcome of the disease, and we should understand um, the evolution process involving the quasi-species to really get an idea of what's happening um, when a disease um, occurs. So previously, we, were, we didn't have the technology to do this that we, at the depth that we needed to. However, new sequencing technology and the computational uh, models that are built around it has now allowed us to do this, um, whereas we, at, at depths that we could not previously do before. Okay, so this is a cartoon of a virus population. And you can see some little pink viruses and you see some blue viruses. Um, the pink viruses are the ones that do really well in the host and there's more of them because of it. The blue viruses are maybe the newer mutations that haven't really taken off or just are not that fit in that particular host environment. So these viruses exist in large populations um, with a dominant genotype, which is shown in the pink, and that's called the consensus sequence. Now with the old sequencing technologies, in order to look at the sequence, they would just sample a very small part of the population. And so when they had the genotype, it didn't represent the mutation that was present or the variation that was present in the population. Sometimes they could sample more with some slight variations on the technique, but nothing like we can do with a new genome sequencing Jonathan will be describing. This samples a large part of the population, and then you can start seeing the variation present. Now, these are examples of what the sequencing data looks like, the data output. The traditional sequencing was called Sanger sequencing, and, and it's still used. It's a very good, precise method, and it gives you data that looks like this. You see peaks that represent the different nucleotides present, and so you just read peak to peak, and it will tell you the nucleotide sequence. Sometimes it captures a little bit of the variation present in the population. If you have two genotypes that are present, you might see overlapping peaks. And that's what you're seeing underneath the arrow there. You're seeing one genotype that has a C at that site and one genotype that has a T at the site. And you can actually visualize the peaks overlapping. But that only happens if that second genotype is pretty common, like above 20%. So again, you're missing most of the variation. Now these data, which I, I know aren't that clear, this represents the next generation sequencing that we use. Now, you can see the A's, G's, C's, or T's, or, or maybe you can't, but that's what those lines say. 
But you can imagine there's many, many more of those and more, more likely to catch um, variation rather than just looking at the, the most common sequence. And actually, when we sequence, that goes down about probably 30x coverage of each genome, 30 reads or so. We go down to 10 or 20,000. So we look at much um, more detail when we do this type of sequencing. Okay, and here's a video on the human genome sequencing to give you a little perspective and to remind you of some genetic terminology. You've probably heard of the human genome, the huge collection of genes inside each and every one of your cells. You probably also know that we've sequenced the human genome. But what does that actually mean? How do you sequence someone's genome? Let's back up a bit. What is a genome? Well, a genome is all the genes, plus some extra, that make up an organism. Genes are made up of DNA, and DNA is made up of long paired strands of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Your genome is the code that your cells use to know how to behave. Cells interacting together make tissues. Tissues cooperating with each other make organs. Organs cooperating with each other make an organism. You. So, you are who you are in large part because of your genome. Knowing the sequence of the billions of letters that make up your genome is the goal of genome sequencing. A genome is both really, really big and very, very small. The individual letters of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, are only 8 or 10 atoms wide, and they're all packed together into a clump, like a ball of yarn. So, to get all that information out of that tiny space, scientists first have to break the long string of DNA down into smaller pieces. Each of these pieces is then separated in space and sequenced individually. But how? It's helpful to remember that DNA binds to other DNA if the sequences are the exact opposite of each other. A's bind to T's, and T's bind to A's. G's bind to C's, and C's to G's. If the A, T, G, C sequence of two pieces of DNA are exact opposites, they stick together. Because the genome pieces are so very small, we need some way to increase the signal we can detect from each of the individual letters. In the most common method, scientists use enzymes to make thousands of copies of each genome piece. So we now have thousands of replicas of each of the genome pieces, all with the same sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. But we have to read them all somehow. To do this, we need to make a batch of special letters, each with a distinct color. A mixture of these special colored letters and enzymes are then added to the genome we're trying to read. At each spot on the genome, one of the special letters binds to its opposite letter. So we now have a double-stranded piece of DNA with a colorful spot at each letter. Scientists then take pictures of each snippet of genome. Seeing the order of the colors allows us to read the sequence. The sequences of each of these millions of pieces of DNA are stitched together using computer programs to create a complete sequence of the entire genome. This isn't the only way to read the letter sequences of pieces of DNA, but it's one of the most common. Of course, just reading the letters in the genome doesn't tell us much. It's kind of like looking through a book written in a language you don't speak. You can recognize all the letters, but still have no idea what's going on. So the next step is to decipher what the sequence means. Hello, everybody. So I'm a computer scientist by formal training. Um, but what I want to talk a lot now about is more about the sequencing technology. Um, and, and the reason is, as a computer scientist, it's very important to understand the kind of data that we're working with. Um, and also, it's really an exciting time for DNA sequencing technology because we're really in a period of undergoing some very rapid changes in the field. 
And so what I'm showing here are just sort of the three phases of sequencing technology that uh, sort of are, that, that are taking place. So really starting 40 years ago was the advent of uh, sequencing with Sanger sequencing and was the mainstay for over 30 years um, in the field. And this was, you know, the, the type of technology that led to the sequencing of the first human genome. But the kind of sequencing that we're using now that you just saw an introduction to, which is ref we refer to as this next generation sequencing, um, started in about 2005 and is what's really sort of opened up this field for looking at viral evolution in a different way. But in addition to that, there's a lot of new sequencing technology out there that's sort of um, in, in the research field that we also want to keep an eye on. So it's a very active time for development uh, in this area. And I want to just sort of highlight a key kind of uh, uh, advance in this area of what makes this uh, field possible right now. And I've got my, uh, our colleague, Dr. Crystal Zhang, was kind enough to lend me one of these flow cells that we use at our in the lab at Livermore. Um, and it's the ability to really to spot millions to billions of genetic fragments on this glass slide that allows you to capture the sequences uh, that, are, uh, that you want to interrogate. So instead of just being able to look at a couple hundred fragments at a time, we're able to actually interrogate on this glass slide, again, uh, hundreds to billions of genetic fragments simultaneously. So another way to look at this is to look and see how sequencing costs have gone down over the, of, over the last decade or so. So this is uh, something that is put out by the National Institute of Health to track the cost of genome sequencing over the years. Uh, starting in 2001 with the release of the first human genome, uh, if you were to sequence a human genome in 2001, it would cost about $100 million and take a team of scientists really to do that work. Now, in 2016, we've really just got to the point where it's cost about approaching the cost of $1,000 to sequence an individual human genome and really takes the labor of a single individual to run the machine to do that work. And you can see this, the arrow is sort of pointing to this inflection point where this new next generation sequencing technology was introduced. And since that time, the ability to basically fit more genetic fragments on that glass side has been able to grow dramatically in the last 10 years or so. So I kind of like to think about sequencing technology as an analog to computing technology. And we have this whole array of tools that we can work with in this field. Um, on the left, I'm sort of showing what would be the analog to a supercomputer the latest sequencing machines, which are very powerful and also very expensive um, and are only available in a few sequencing centers around the country, are able to sequence on the order of about 50 human genomes in a single day. In the middle, we've got sort of the equivalent of our desktop computer, in this case, the benchtop sequencers, which are now becoming more and more ubiquitous really in in research labs around the country, probably many molecular biology labs at universities will have, have these sequencers. Um, and they have about the power to sequence about a single human genome in a day. And the third sort of category of sequencing technology that we have are these, what I think of as mobile sequencing technologies, mobile sequencers, which can fit in the palm of your hand and actually can be uh, used in remote locations. They only need to basically be plugged into a laptop at this point. But the sequencing power is still not quite matching what the desktop or the, uh, or the, or the mainframe uh, sequencer can do. So they're sequencing on the order of a bacterial or viral genome in a day. But they're very exciting because they're really moving towards this sort of democratization of sequencing where anybody can do sequencing. But before I get too excited about this development of sequencing, I kind of like to think about it, try and put a historical perspective and try and think about where are we in this development of the technology. Um, so on the, on the right is sort of the kind of large supercomputers that we're using today at Livermore for analyzing large data sets. And on the left is sort of a mainframe computer of the 50s, which I would mark as the first decade of introducing computing as a commercial application. And really, in sequencing, we're kind of in the first decade of 
of applying sequencing as a commercial application. So I kind of tend to think of where we are right now as closer to the left side of the picture rather than the right side. So I kind of think that people in the audience today will probably be the ones that really are able to capitalize on the dramatic changes that will be happening in sequencing 10 or 20 years from now. So to take this now back to how we're going to apply this to viral evolution, uh, really the sequencing technology right now is being driven by human genomics and the desire to sequence an individual genome as a part of routine medical care and to have your insurance companies pay for that sequencing. But we can sort of surf that same technology curve to apply it to monitoring viral evolution and infectious disease. And so you can think about it in the context of the cost that it takes to sequence a single human genome, we can also equivalently sequence on the order of 600,000 RNA viral genomes, and that allows us to look at the viral genome in a totally different way. So to sort of reiterate where we were in the past, if you were to use Sanger sequencing, you might capture on the order of several hundred genetic fragments from the viral population. And what you would end up with is a, a bunch of fragments that essentially look all the same and are capturing the most dominant vir virus genome type in the population. And, and so what you have is this sort of canonical classical view of a virus as being a single variant in a population infecting uh, an individual or, or an animal host. With next generation sequencing, we can typically capture or monitor or track over 100 million genetic fragments in that viral population in the order of a sequencing reaction that can take on the order of three days. So it's relatively still efficient to run this process. And it can essentially change the picture of this viral population back to what we wanted, what we were sort of actually now can see is a much more diverse viral genetic population than we were previously monitoring. And the reason why this is important is to recall sort of our fundamental hypothesis here, which is that this viral population has all of the mutations contained within it to better adapt to new environmental conditions. So if that virus population encounters a new host or some uh, other kind of uh, countermeasure that might be preventing it from growing or, and ma maintaining health, it, the hypothesis or the premise is, is that we ha there's mutations buried in that population that will allow it to better respond or adapt to these changing conditions. And with this new deep sequencing technology, we can now start to see all of these mutations that are actually present in the population. So as I've said, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist, so the interesting part for me to focus on is really the computational challenge here in reconstructing the viral genomes that are present. Now on the left, as we, we're sort of showing these idealized versions of what the viral population looks like. And what we have is essentially, in this case, a hypothetical case of four different types of genomes. But what we actually get from the sequencing technology today is on the right which is just a bunch of short genetic fragments that we, and we don't really know where those fragments came from. And we have to try and figure out which genomes they belong to. Now, this is technically still an unsolved problem. It's very technically difficult to distinguish between uh, real mutations in these fragments, which genomes they belong to, and a complicating factor that we have to deal with is the fact that the sequencers themselves introduce errors. And so we have a double problem here of actually recognizing natural genetic variants in the population and sequencing errors that have been introduced by the sequencer itself. So the way that we've tried to get around this problem is we haven't been able to fully solve the problem of piecing together each individual genome in that population. But what we can do is construct what we call a mutant spectrum of that population. And what we have here, and I'm showing sort of a demonstration of how this process works, we identify what is the most common genome in that population. In this case, it's highlighted on the top and identified it with the letters. And then we take each of those genetic fragments that we've sequenced on the order of 100 million and align them or map them to see where they best fit relative to our reference sequence. 
And so what I'm showing here is uh, after we've mapped those sequences to that reference strain or that reference dominant consensus sequence, we step through each position and look and see what the fragments are saying about what genetic variants are present. And we have to go through a process to look and see, do we have enough evidence in these reads to say that a real mutation is occurring and not something from a random sequencing error? So in this example, at a position where we see a cytosine as the dominant, we look and see what the reads are saying or what the sequencer fragments are telling us, and we're saying that there's four examples of fragments that are saying that there's a thiamine present in the population, and we, uh, we construct a statistical model to say that we are seeing enough of these alternative fragments to say that there's actually a thiamine present as a rare variant in this population. And this is a fairly computationally expensive process to run through. It can take several hours to do this processing for a single sample uh, running on a fairly expensive computer. And so now we're actually, Liz is going to uh, show us actually how this uh, process is computed using, uh, it, it, using I'd say, the old fashioned human, human labor to do this. Okay, so first off, we have coming out a small snippet of a consensus sequence for rabies. So these guys are going to manage to get this thing unrolled. And stretch it out and do the knee. There we go. All righty. So this is just a very small part of a consensus sequence of rabies. It's only a 20 or so base pairs long. We're going to do a manual alignment with a couple of fragments that would have been produced from sequencing. So if you guys would come join me and you guys get to find their fragment alignment. Um, so they're looking for matches. They may get a perfect match. They may get a not so perfect match. And so single base pair errors would be an example of variance within the population. And so they are looking to match up T's to T's and G's to G's. We all found our spot. And there we go. Um, most of them do match up perfectly. We do have a couple of mutations here. We have a T that swapped out for a cytosine. Uh, and there's another one down over there as well. Uh, and they're showing possible variants. One of them is an actual vari variant that's found in rabies, showing a new quasi-species or a different quasi-species. The other one is truly just a sequencing error. Um, and so the difficulty of identifying which is which. We are looking at maybe a double fold or a two-layered overlap. Remember, when this is being done on a computer, you're going 10,000 deep. So it gives you a lot more data and a much better idea as to which are actual mutations and which ones are sequencing boo-boos. All right, guys, thank you very much. So you can get the idea that uh, with Sanger sequencing, when we only had a few fragments, this is the kind of thing that you could actually do manually. But uh, with next generation sequencing, this is not something that you want to do uh, by hand if you can help it. So the last thing that I want to sort of show here is actually just a collection, an example of what these mutant spectrums look like. Um, on the, this is a case of showing two different viral populations. On the x-axis here, it's actually showing the position in the viral genome. Each point it represents a, re a mutation present in the uh, relative to the genome in the population at different relative frequencies. So there's two, two populations here. One is highlighted with the yellow triangles. The other is highlighted with the blue uh, pluses. Uh, one is a natural viral population, and the other is taking the, a single virus from that population and growing it in the laboratory. Now, I don't know, as a thought exercise, you can tell me or think whether you have intuition about which is the natural population and which is the laboratory-grown population. So you might, it might be giving it away with my labels here. Uh, the clone is the, is the laboratory strain. And as you can see, it's much less, has many less mutations. 
And what we see here is that we've got a much shorter evolutionary time period. So starting with a single dominant clone and growing it in the lab, it only has time to accumulate a few mutations, whereas this natural isolate taken from a blood sample has many more genetic variants present in the population and reflects a much longer evolutionary time frame. But to, to emphasize the point, really over, it wasn't until around the, the time of around 2005 that people really appreciated that there was these mutations growing on such a rapid time scale in the laboratory where the laboratory strain was actually creating a new mutant spectra or a new quasi-species population. Up to that point, it was generally kind of taken for granted that it was a single clonal population without any genetic variants. And so now Monica is going to come and tell you more about how we've been applying this, these tools to looking at a real outbreak, uh, the rabies outbreak. OK, so now that you know a little bit about viruses and the sequencing we use to look at the virus populations, we'll apply this to a real life outbreak. So in 2009, I was talking to my friend at California Department of Health. Her name's Sharon Messenger. She studies rabies virus evolution. And she happened to mention that there was an outbreak of rabies in Humboldt County, and that it appeared that a, a rabies virus that was normally found in skunks had jumped into the fox population and was now being spread fox to fox. And it was actually a pretty terrifying situation because rabid foxes can be quite aggressive. So. It was um, something that um, a naturally occurring outbreak that's nearby that we could get samples for, and we decided to try um, to understand what's happening to the viral populations during this host jump from skunks to foxes. OK, so before I start, how many people know if rabies can make you very sick? Is that a type of virus that can make you very sick? Yes. yes? Can it ever kill you? Yes. yes. Um, about what percent of the time does it kill an infected person with symptoms? 7.12. That's close. Now, you actually take that and you add like a 92% and you're there. <laughs> it's, it's very close to 100%. So if you're infected with the virus, once you start showing symptoms, for the most part, your life is over. It's a very, in fact, it is the most deadly virus. So the idea is that when you're exposed to an animal that may be ra rabid, such as one that's behaving abnormally, maybe it's not usually out at night and now, or at, during the day and now here it is, or it's you know, biting on your leg and you're trying to walk away and it won't let go. So these times are when you go to your doctor and they can give you shots and medicine. They'll make sure that you don't get the rabies virus because, because by the time you are showing symptoms, then there isn't really much they can do. All right, so rabies is an important virus. It kills about 59,000 people a year. Most of these people are in developing countries, and the animals around them are not vaccinated. We're lucky we've got good vaccines that we give our pet dogs, for example, that for the most part protects us from being exposed to rabies um, frequently. So there's bat rabies, which I'm sure you've heard of, but there's also different non-bat terrestrial mammals that serve as reservoirs or, or populations that the virus can be maintained in. And that's what this slide is showing. This is showing that in a number of parts of the country, skunks are the reservoir species. On the east, it's raccoons. So you can see there's a few different skunk populations, and they're shown in different colors. And that's because the rabies virus that are in skunks in California are not genetically identical to the ones in Texas. So they have variants according to the geographic location and the host. And so if you were to, OK, if, if a person were to come down with rabies and passed away, they could take a piece of the sequence from the rabies virus in the brain, sequence it, and tell you, oh, this person was probably exposed to raccoons in New York, for example. OK, it's, so you can tell by the sequence, the host usually or the, um, and the location. OK, so you can see in California, we have skunk rabies, striped skunks. The rabies circulates in these populations, and there are um, occasional house jumps. For example, if the, if the skunk was to bite, your, bite a dog, 
the dog would come down with rabies, but you wouldn't see a spread through the dog population. So the virus, for the most part, stays in skunks. Okay, and so there was an outbreak in 2009 in Humboldt County, and that's what this map is showing. The red dots are the cases where they actually got rabies from the animal, and the black dots are attack cases, or animal encounters. And you can see it was a fairly decent outbreak, especially when you look at the histogram, the graph to the side of it. In the 90s, you can see there are very few cases. Most of them were in skunks with the occasional fox. In 2003, you see an increase in the number of foxes with rabies. And then starting in 2007 and moving on up to 2009, you see many more foxes having rabies. Now, one thing to note is that when a skunk gets rabies, oftentimes the skunk will get kind of lethargic and sick, but will just kind of go into its hole and die. But with foxes, they tend to be very aggressive, and they actually seek out targets. In fact, people were chased up to their apartments, and the fox waited outside and you know, chewed on its shoe or something. I mean, really, really aggressive animals. Um, so the foxes are more noticeable. Um, so you do occasionally see a um, fox rabies case normally, but you don't see what you see in 2009. All right, now the last thing I want to point out on that map is I'm going to be talking about geographic locations within Humboldt County. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but in the middle of this slide, um, you see kind of a concentration of red dots near the bay and um, Eureka area. Um, that's kind of the cutoff. We had kind of saw a northern group and a southern group, just so kind of orientate you. Um, and often the virus seemed to move, start down south and kind of move on up um, according to dates. Okay, so Sharon was able to get us samples um, from the health department of brains of animals that had rabies from this area. We got a number of cases or a number of samples, um, about 40 of them from 2009 outbreak, but we also got some historical samples from 2003 and 1995 for comparison. Um, because we were able to get the actual brain tissue, we didn't have to grow the virus in the lab. We could use PCR to sequence the viral genome away from the host genome, get lots of copies, and understand what's happening um, at the population level. If you grow a virus in the lab, you change the genome a little bit. So the best way is to get lots of naturally infected samples. And so we really hit a gold mine with this particular outbreak. Um, so we do some molecular biology, we create lots of sequence, and then we dump it all on Jonathan, who makes sense of it for us. So he's doing all those alignments on 45 different samples in this case. So not a little bit of work. Okay, so I'm going to be showing the data in a couple different ways, and I thought I'd introduce that before I showed you the data. The first thing uh, you do is you look at the consensus most common sequence. And you want to relate one sequence to another, or I'm sorry, one sample to another. And to do this, we do something called um, phylogeny. We build a phylogenetic tree, which is a lot like a, um, a family tree. So you see branches extending out, and on the end of the branches, you see letters there. And those are the individuals that we're comparing. And this is just a, an example. Um, and you can see each of those individuals have different sequences. Um, in the case of A and B, this region is identical, and those two group together. With C, you see a mutation, so it's similar but not exact, and it's clustered next to it, and so on. So you can see that F, G, and H have more mutations. Um, they don't have that T at the beginning, for example, and they group together. So this is just a way of looking at um, samples that are evolutionarily related and understanding which ones are more similar and which ones are more diverse or, or more different. Okay. The other thing we do is we look at a few different types of data. So if a virus doesn't mutate that much or you're just looking at a part that hasn't changed that much, you can get a lot of information from the nucleotide sequence. But if you're looking at a virus that mutates a lot and you're looking at the whole genome, pretty soon you have so many mutations to look at, you don't even know where to start. So what we do is we try to figure out which mutations are likely to change the way the virus behaves. And to do that, we focus on the amino acid changes. So some codons can be different, but they'll code for the same amino acid. 
Um, in those cases, those nucleotide changes really wouldn't make much difference in the way the virus functions. But some of them do change the amino acid that's coded for, and this can change the way the protein um, interacts with other proteins, for example. Okay, so we look at amino acid changes, and then we look at the deep sequence data, and that's what's shown here, but we look at much, much more of it. Okay, so before I start a, a um, research project, I usually have in my mind what I imagine the data is going to look like. I mean, you are doing a, a project because you have a hypothesis, and so the data is going to look like this. And when you're doing research, most of the time you're wrong. I mean, it's very humbling to be a researcher because you just realize how many times and how often you are wrong, and you've got to adjust. And so this is what um, the data I thought would look like. We have a skunk virus that has now moved into the fox population. It is going fox to fox. This hasn't happened before, so it must be different genetically, right? So I thought the fox samples would cluster together and the skunk samples would cluster together. And then you have some influence of the date when the virus um, was circulating. Now here is the actual data that we got. Um, first of all, we've got a northern cluster and a southern cluster. So it clustered by a geographic region. And then you can also see a cluster according to date, whether it was 2009, 2003, or 1995. But the skunks are in white text. Do you see them clustering together? No, no, they're mixed in with the foxes, so there goes my theory. Um, but what we did see was that in the northern cluster, and I actually took out 20 foxes from that cluster and left them off this graph because we didn't have enough space, we saw lots and lots of foxes in the north with the virus, and we saw much fewer in the south. So as we looked at the data, we realized maybe the host jump didn't occur until later in the outbreak, and then it was mainly manifested in the northern section of the area, the outbreak area. And so that was our new hypothesis. And then when we looked to see if there were any amino acids changes that distinguished that group in the north, we found two changes. And they both occurred on the protein on the surface of the virus. And that protein is responsible for negotiating binding to the host cell and entering the host cell. So that made sense. That gave us some support for our hypothesis. And then finally, we looked at the um, quasi-species data, the unique data that we had gathered. And this is an illustration of what we found. Um, on the left, you're seeing lots of little blue viruses. And those represent the genotype that was present in 1995. Now, you see one pink virus. And that virus represents the genotype that emerged to cause the outbreak. And that actually for the most part, emerged in 2003 and changed just a little bit to cause the big outbreak, from what we could tell. But because that genotype was already present in our 1995 samples, that implied that that genotype was there, found a new host, and expanded and did much better in that new host. So you can see the promise of an outbreak genotype, the trace of it in 1995 already, and then when you go to 2003, 2009 samples, you see that that genotype took off, but there's still remnants of what was present in 1995. So that's called molecular memory, and that could be important if you're doing a forensic study. So that was just absolutely fascinating. And this is a repeat of the same type of data, just a little bit more specific. So putting this on the tree. If you look at the blue square there on the left, that's the 1995 amino acid changes, or a subset of them that we found. At nucleotide 308, we saw a change from leucine, which was present at 99%. At I'm sorry, not a change. We saw leucine at 99% there, and phenylalanine at 308 in about 1%. So dominant amino acid was leucine by far, trace of phenylalanine. If you look at that same site in the 2003 samples, 308, you now see phenylalanine has taken over and just a trace of leucine. And we saw that at several different sites in the genome where the amino acid that characterized the outbreak genotype was already present in that population. So in this case, we had dominant amino acids that became rare 
and then rare amino acids that became dominant. We saw that inversion. And that's really what characterized the outbreak for us. Now, this is one of the first studies we did using this type of data. And it was really interesting to see how the consensus sequence really didn't reveal how the outbreak occurred until you started looking really deep into the population and used more of the data. So we found that using next generation sequencing data gave us much higher resolution and helped us understand the outbreak. Okay, so going back to the beginning, what we would like to do is to build the capabilities to be able to predict an outbreak before it happens so we can put measures in place. This kind of work is the first step to doing that. You need to be able to know what's circulating, know what's out there, know what changes in the genome could change, could influence the outcome of a infection or a um, small outbreak, might allow the virus to become more widespread, and in that way you can prepare. So the next gene se genome sequencing combined with very important things like understanding the basic biology of the virus, understanding how the population of humans might react, you know, do they go to the doctor when they see this or not? That was important for the Ebola outbreak. All these interdisciplinary um, people must come together and start building the capabilities for predictive biology. But it will involve next generation sequencing technology because it does help us to understand the mechanisms of virus evolution. Okay, and these are the people who helped generate some of this data. You see scientists from the California Department of Health, as well as bioinformaticists and molecular and virology um, experts. Okay, and I, this, I want to thank you for your attention, and we'll take any questions. <laughs>